So good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen and others, um, to this session, which is uh, jointly organized between PARS and the Center for Global Migration here at University of Gothenburg. And I have been given the great honor of introducing our next keynote speaker, uh, Nicolas de Genova, uh, who has done some very thought-provoking work and inspired scholars, I think, the world over to think about the legal production of illegality, deportability, um, order spectacles, but also crisis and, and race. And we are honored and very happy and excited that you are here. So I will give you the floor and after your talk, open up for questions and discussion. So, very welcome. Thank you, Anna, for a very kind introduction. And, and thanks also to the organizers um, for the opportunity to be here with you. Um, over the last few years, we've become accustomed to ubiquitous and virtually unanimous proclamations in mass-mediated public discourse and in the dominant political debate regarding a so-called crisis of migration and refugee movements in Europe. Indeed, what came to be labeled as the migrant crisis or the refugee crisis in Europe was the hallmark of a discourse that was so hegemonic that can now be understood to be a kind of watershed, a kind of historical watershed, such that more recently it's become increasingly customary to refer to our present moment as post-crisis. The first intimations of a crisis of the borders of Europe arose amidst the unsightly accumulation of dead black and brown bodies awash on the Halcyon shores of the Mediterranean Sea. When a ship transporting as many as 850 migrants and refugees capsized on April 19, 2015, all but 28 of the vessel's passengers were sent to their deaths in what appears to have been the worst border crossing shipwrecked in the Mediterranean, in the Mediterranean on record. Along with another incident during that same week, more than 1,300 people died. These events instantly established the prospect that 2015 would earn the dubious distinction of the most deadly year to date for would-be asylum seekers braving Europe's borders. Subsequently, unnumbered capsized so-called migrant boats and incidents of mass death turned that grim likelihood into a gruesome fact. Uh, more than 3,675 migrants were reported to have died in 2015 alone. Then 2016 finished yet again as the deadliest year on record with 4,329 migrant and refugee deaths recorded in the Mediterranean. This year, as of last week, the total number of such deaths remains alarmingly high. 2,961 this year so far. Uh, these human catastrophes at sea have indisputably transformed the maritime borders of Europe into a macabre deathscape. Following the April 2015 shipwreck, the accumulating momentum of a gathering storm of human mobility over both land and sea served to fix in place a newfound dominant common sense about a so-called migrant crisis. Then on September 2nd, 2015, social media followed by the mass news media briefly became captivated by the haunting photographs featuring the corpse of a drowned Syrian boy soon identified as Aylan Kurvi washed ashore in Turkey after a failed attempt to reach the Greek island of Kos left at least 12 people dead. Abruptly, the desensitizing and rather cynical rhetoric of a migrant crisis began to recede in favor of appeals for compassion in the face of tragedy, accompanied by a revised, if ephemeral, language of refugee crisis. The putative crisis surrounding the influx of migrants and refugees in Europe has long been nowhere more extravagantly put on display than in the Mediterranean Sea. Indeed, for several years now, the European Union has actively converted the Mediterranean into a veritable mass grave. 
beyond the Mediterranean, furthermore, the borders of Europe have been effectively externalized across the entire expanse of the Sahara Desert. On a global scale, intensified and increasingly militarized enforcement at border crossings of easiest passage relegates illegalized migrant and refugee mobilities into zones of more severe hardship and potentially lethal passage. But alongside a proliferation of migrant deaths and transit in border zones across the planet, the Mediterranean has incontestably earned the disgraceful distinction of being the veritable epicenter of such deadly border crossings. With the Mediterranean accounting for 75% of the recorded migrant deaths worldwide last year alone, um, prior to the record high death tolls of 2015 and 2016, untold tens of thousands of refugees, migrants, and their children have been consigned to horrific, unnatural, premature deaths by shipwreck and drowning, often following protracted ordeals of hunger, thirst, exposure, and abandonment on the high seas. The most comprehensive database documenting migrant and refugee deaths during attempts to traverse the borders of Europe estimates the total number of European border deaths at more than 30,000 since the late 1990s. So the singularity or momentousness of the shipwreck of April 19, 2015 was in fact only apparent because it came as merely the most ghastly and most publicized in a long and unrelenting list of comparable episodes that have rendered such human disasters utterly banal. Prospective migrant shipwrecks have perhaps been abated intermittently and inconsistently during one or another period of heightened search and rescue operations by the various enforcers of the borders of Europe. But it's likewise probable that in the aftermath of such human tragedies, countless potential incidents of, math, of mass death for migrants and refugees at sea may have been circumvented by the sheer versatility of migratory movements that have sought alternate routes over land. Hence, following the April 2015 shipwreck, although there continued to be a record high volume of migration across the central Mediterranean for months thereafter, there was also a massive reorientation uh, of migratory movements to land routes through the Balkans. Of course, the option of illegalized travel by land routes is also treacherous. Hunger, thirst, exposure, abandonment, and the related lethal risks are not the exclusive travails of illegalized maritime crimes. On August 27, 2015, for instance, Austrian police discovered an abandoned meat truck on the highway at Nikolsdorf near the Hungarian border in which 71 mainly Syrian and Iraqi migrants and refugees' bodies were decomposing in a sealed refrigeration compartment. Hundreds, if not thousands, of migrants and refugees have died of asphyxiation after extended periods of overcrowded transit by road or rail in sealed, unventilated shipping containers. And other means of clandestine, illegalized transport over land, while others have merely met their doom, dangling precariously from the bottoms of moving trains and trucks. In addition, migrants must navigate the sometimes deadly violence of European border enforcement authorities, as well as their non-European counterparts to whom they frequently outsource the most aggressive sorts of border policing. On May 9th of last year, Slovakian police fired live ammunition at border crosses at the border with Hungary, wounding a Syrian refugee woman. A few weeks earlier, Human Rights Watch had reported that Turkish soldiers were firing live rounds at Syrian civilian border crosses. In addition to these more flagrant forms of violence associated with border policing, another form of border casualty arises from the structural violence uh, that arises in the context of migratory legal indeterminacy, such as the lack of access to critical health care during extended periods of migrant transit, or the often callous disregard for migrant and refugee medical needs during detention or deportation. Beyond the borders, moreover, migrants and refugees must also continue to confront other European police forces routinely engaged in the much more mundane work of superintending everyday migrant precarity. In addition to the immigration policing by state authorities, such precarity among migrants and refugees is likewise 
enforced through the less systematic but no less systemic physical attacks of far-right anti-immigrant anti racists. Regardless of the specific sites and forms of bordering, however, countless migrants and refugees' lives have been mercilessly, mercilessly sacrificed in the interest of instituting a new Europe encircled by ever-increasingly militarized and securitized borders. The outright disposability of migrants and refugees' lives is usually accompanied by callous disregard, but also sporadically instigates the occasions for expressions of sanctimonious hypocrisy. Following the reports of the April 19th shipwreck in 2015, as has happened repeatedly so many times before and since, European authorities were immediately catapulted into a political frenzy to redress what was designated to be a tragedy of epic proportions. Predictably, however, despite the obligatory pronouncements of exalted humanitarian ideals, the ensuing public discourse and political debate were compulsively preoccupied with so-called illegal migration and the allegedly criminal predations of smugglers and traffickers as pretexts for renewed and expanded tactics of militarized interdiction, including proposals to bomb the coasts of Libya, from which many maritime border crossers depart, or even to deploy ground troops. In other words, the invocation of tragedy more or less immediately came to be cynically conscripted to supply the pretexts, reinforcing and aggravating precisely the mere material and practical conditions of possibility for the escalation in migrant deaths, namely the fortification of various forms of border policing that inevitably served to channel illegalized human mobility into ever more perilous pathways and modes of passage. After all, it is the very fact of border enforcement that makes such illegalized and consequently dangerous journeys an utter necessity. Migrants and other asylum seekers can only become illegal, after all, if there have been legislative or enforcement-based measures to render particular migrations or types of migration, if quote-unquote illegal, to illegalize them. From this standpoint, there are not really illegal migrants or illegal migrations so much as illegalized migrants. The origins of such illegalizations are usually located where very few of us can ever see them plainly, because they're the product of lawmaking and arise from the deliberations, debates, and decisions of lawmakers. This is what I've called the legal production of migrant illegality. However, through measures that intensify the policing of physical territorial borders, we all become largely unwitting witnesses to a grand spectacle where the border is staged and where we may be led to believe in the elusive specter of its violation by the seemingly devious and cunning migrants who transgress it. This is what I've called the border spectacle, a spectacle of enforcement at the border, whereby migrant illegality is rendered spectacularly visible. The material practices of immigration and border policing thereby become enmeshed in a dense weave of discourse and representation and generate a constant redundancy of still more of these languages and images. Thus, the border spectacle sets a scene, a scene of ostensible exclusion, where allegedly unwanted or undesirable, or in any case unqualified or ineligible, migrants must be stopped, kept out, turned around. As a scene of exclusion, the border appears to demonstrate, verify, and legitimate the purported naturalness and putative necessity of such exclusion, repeatedly, redundantly. So through these emphatic and grandiose gestures of exclusion, border enforcement performatively activates the image of migrant illegality as a seemingly real thing, as an apparently objective truth. Of course, it's a well-established fact the vast majority of illegalized migrants within the European Union do not enter by physically crossing territorial borders clandestinely or in unseaworthy boats uh, at all, but rather do so in a perfectly legal manner with a visa to a European destination, only later to become quote-unquote illegal once it has expired 
but such mundane and relatively invisible processes do not supply the requisite spectacle of borders that can be represented as out of control, beleaguered by so-called invasions or floods of so-called illegal migrants. Instead, the interdiction of so-called migrant boats in the Mediterranean, much like the enforcement efforts of the land borders throughout the Balkans and beyond, have supplied a more or less constant border spectacle that thus appears to verify, appears to verify both the irregularity and disorder of seemingly uncontrollable migrant and refugee movements, as well as lend credibility and reality to the otherwise elusive European borders themselves. Indeed, it is the European legal framework governing travel visas, migration, and asylum that together preclude literally the vast majority of humanity from access to the EU by either travel visas or established channels for so-called legal migration. As you can see in red, travelers from all of Africa and virtually all of Asia require visas for travel to any Schengen zone country for which the inordinate majority of prospective applicants cannot qualify. In general, as signatories to the 1951 Refugee Convention, most European countries are obliged to consider all asylum applications lodged under territory, but refuse to consider asylum applications lodged abroad, and there are ordinarily no provisions in their immigration guidelines for anyone abroad to be given permission to travel to their countries to petition for asylum. Thus, the combination of law and policy regarding asylum and immigration and European travel visas together compel labor migrants and refugees alike to first arrive on European territory as so-called unauthorized asylum seekers, and hence as de facto illegal migrants, who only then may be permitted to petition for asylum. Consequently, the commonplace deployment of the term asylum seeker inherently invokes the specter of the allegedly bogus of the allegedly bogus refugee. The asylum seeker figured as someone seeking undue benefits, the undeserving, merely so-called economic migrant opportunistically claiming asylum. Here we may recognize that these people on the move across state borders are not in fact considered to be the genuine bearers of any presumptive purportedly universal human right to asylum, but rather are always under suspicion or suspicion of deception and subterfuge produced as the inherently dubious claimants to various forms of institutionalized international protection. Similarly, the presumptive and pervasive depiction of refugees as mere migrants has been a crucial discursive maneuver in the spectacle of Europe's border crisis. Little surprise then that European authorities' ambivalent and belated magnanimity toward those who may ultimately be granted the status of bona fide refugees has repeatedly been coupled uh, with promises of expedited expulsion for those who may eventually be deemed to be only migrants, unwelcome, presumably irregular, and undesirable, illegalized, and deportable all. This has been abundantly manifest in the implementation of the so-called hotspot strategy devised by the EU in response to the escalating numbers of migrants and refugees in 2015 and implemented at several ports in Italy and the Greek islands, the most prominent of which uh, being Lampedusa and Lesbos. Hotspots were proposed as emergency reception centers at key ports of first arrival on EU territory for the purpose of speedy identification, registration, and fingerprinting. In practice, the hotspots operate as detention camps dedicated to the perfunctory and crass sorting between those deemed to be likely to have a credible asylum petition, who are then to be redistributed to other EU countries, and everyone else who has served a deportation order as quickly as possible. Of course, those who refuse to be fingerprinted are frequently subjected to physical coercion, and others are simply subjected to indefinite detention in the closed prison sections of the hotspot camps. When the hotspot began operation in Lampedusa, uh, sorry, newly, newly arrived refugees and migrants were asked to fill out a multiple choice form in Italian indicating their reason for coming to Italy. They were allowed to respond, A, to work. B, 
to escape misery. C, for family reunification. Or D, some other reason. Because most were unable to read and understand the form, the forms were commonly, in fact, completed by Italian border police. The nondescript, none of the above option was literally the only occasion whereby they could indicate a desire to apply for asylum. The great majority were consequently rejected the same day and received what was officially called a Deferred Refoulement Decree, better known as the Seven Days Decree, which obliged them to deliver themselves to Rome's Fiumicino Airport within seven days and leave the country at their own expense. Commonly, they were in fact transported by Italian police to the railway station at Agrigento. in Sicily, and abandoned without any money or even instructions about where to go. At the height of the so-called migrant or refugee crisis, these hotspot deportation orders therefore ensured that the vast majority of newly arrived asylum seekers were pre presumptively rejected, and preemptively so, in flagrant disregard for the integrity of any customary asylum procedure and were effectively almost instantly converted into illegalized migrants who were precisely not deported, but would remain deportable and were left to their own devices. Thus, the hotspot system is plainly a machine for the expedited legal production of migrant illegality. Here it's instructive to recall the migration regime that prevailed in much of Western Europe between the calamitous destruction of World War II and the more recent era in which migrant illegality has proliferated. Beginning in the period of reconstruction after World War II, the extended era of guest worker labor recruitment established frameworks for the importation of colonial and post-colonial labor in Western European countries. When that regime came to an end, a new regime premised on asylum effectively foreclosed all other routes for legal migration for the great majority, and required the great majority of migrants to now refashion their mobility accordingly. Labor migration thereby assumed what was frequently the only permissible form, that of refugees fleeing persecution and seeking asylum. Predictably, the inevitable result was an ever-increasing and ever more aggressive outcry against the allegedly fake or bogus asylum seekers. By the 1990s, when the increasingly integrated post-Cold War European asylum system had succeeded to produce the material and practical conditions of possibility for a burgeoning influx of illegalized migrants. In the wake of uh, the new policies of free movement for Europeans, furthermore, most of the so-called illegal migrants would now inevitably be non-white, non-Europeans. Judging it on the basis of its real effects, Therefore, the European asylum system is precisely not a system for granting asylum to refugees, judging it on the basis of its real effects. It routinely and regularly has denied the great majority recognition as legitimate asylum seekers and has ordinarily granted refugee status to fewer than 15% of applicants. Thus, taken as a larger complex whole, the European asylum system is premised upon a comprehensive suspicion of people seeking asylum, and is effectively designed to disqualify as many applicants as possible as allegedly bogus asylum seekers. Certainly there are sometimes quite drastic differences in the application of asylum policy from one European country to another, of which the refugees themselves are acutely aware and commonly rather well informed. However, the common European asylum system provides for the insulation of the most desirable, wealthier destination countries through the Dublin Regulation. The Dublin Regulation, which legitimizes the commonplace expulsion of asylum seekers from the wealthiest Western and Northern European countries back to the first country where they were registered, usually the poorer Eastern or Southern European border states where they first arrived on EU territory. The Dublin Convention broadens the purview of the European deportation regime allowing for European states not only to deport migrants back to their countries of origin, but also to any so-called safe third country through which they may have transited, literally bouncing them back from one place to another and coercively reversing migratory trajectories, turning them into 
transnational counterflows of expulsion. Here it's crucial to recall that deportation itself is perhaps the premier and most pure contemporary form of forced migration. And thus, the European asylum system itself actually becomes increasingly implicated in producing refugees. Simultaneously, asylum operates as a mechanism of capture. Wherever an asylum claim is processed, once protection is obtained, refugees cannot work or reside elsewhere but that particular country. Given the Dublin regulation, this has long meant a struggle by many migrants and refugees to refuse to be fingerprinted in the countries of first arrival. For instance, between November 2015 and January 2016, a group of 200 Eritrean, Sudanese, and Somali asylum seekers were not allowed to leave Lampedusa for refusing to have their fingerprints taken. Unwilling to claim asylum in Italy, these refugees and migrants organized demonstrations on the island, demanding their right to travel to other European countries uh, where they had relatives or other networks. Thus, the strategic calculation and perfectly predictable predilections among migrants and refugees combined with the Dublin Regulation tend to ensure that Europe, far from a refuge, becomes a space of rejection and marginalization for most of them, and not infrequently involves the coercive dislocation that ensues from serial dis deportations. In terms of its real effects and what it actually produces, therefore, the European asylum system operates as a regime for the production of migrant illegality. In other words, what on the surface may look like a strictly exclusionary regime, in reality operates systematically to ensure that non-European migrants and refugees continue to be included, albeit only to the extent that their inclusion within the social fabric of Europe is a form of racialized subordination through their precaritization or outright illegalization. The so-called crisis of European borders notably corresponds above all to a permanent epistemic instability within the government and mass-mediated representation of transnational human mobility, which itself relies upon the exercise of a power over classifying and naming and partitioning the difference between migrants and refugees, and the more general multiplication of subtle nuances and contradictions among the categories of, that regiment mobility. Indeed, such terminological confusion arises as an inescapable effect of the multifarious subjective reasons and tangled objective predicaments that motivate or compel people to move across state borders or alternately find themselves stranded someplace on routes temporarily but indefinitely stuck someplace along the way on their migratory itineraries, sometimes for several years on end. Simply put, refugees never cease to also have aspirations. And against the dominant ten tendency to figure them as pure victims, and thus as the passive objects of somebody else's compassion or pity or protection, they remain subjects who make more or less calculated strategic and tactical choices about how to reconfigure their lives and advance their life projects despite the dispossession and dislocation of their refugee condition. And when they act like subjects, however, they're perceived to resemble migrants and quickly become suspect. Migrants, by definition, exude an excess of subjectivity. They have too many hopes and dreams, too many plans and projects of their own, and thus from the standpoint of a state's power to control its borders are never compliant enough. On the other hand, it's likewise important to consider that migrants are often in flight, fleeing from various social or political conditions that they've come to deem intolerable, thereby actively escaping or deserting forms of everyday depriva deprivation, persecution, or structural violence that may be no less pernicious for their mundanity. Hence, the labels migrant and refugee commonly remain suspended in a state of tension and ambiguity and may only be sorted into neat and clean distinctions or separated by hermetically sealed partitions through more or less heavy-handed governmental interventions. In the face of the resultant proliferation of alternating and seemingly interchangeable crisis or refugee crisis, therefore, the primary question that we must ask repeatedly is, whose crisis? 
The naming of this crisis as such appears to be precisely a device for the authorization of exceptional or emergency governmental measures toward the ends of enhanced and expanded border enforcement and immigration policing. The spectacle of Europe's border crisis is largely equated, consequently, with a crisis of control over the ostensible borders of Europe. If anything, it is a crisis of sovereignty. Brutal border spectacles of exclusion can often be found to expose, nonetheless, their own obscene dynamics of subordinate, illegalized migrant inclusion. As I've suggested, the border spectacle works its magic trick of displacing illegality from its point of production in the process of lawmaking to the proverbial scene of the crime, the border, which is of course also the scene of ostensible crime fighting. Indeed, this sort of illegalization is the key to making the border into a preeminent scene of exclusion, yet migrants and refugees mobility projects prevail in spite of the accumulated pressures and violences of the borders that they have to cross. In Europe over the last two and a half years, the various deployments of military troops, a riot police against migrants and refugees, the construction of razor wire barricades, and assaults against migrant and refugee families with tear gas, stun grenades, rubber truncheons, and eventually live ammunition have been intermittently alternated with the outright facilitation or the de facto ferrying or escorting of these same migrant movements through merit Either, either through maritime interdiction and rescue, at times even of vessels that have not signaled any distress, or the provision of bus caravans or trains to expedite transit onward. Hence, state tactics of bordering have been abundantly shown to be convulsive reaction formations, responding, always responding, to the primacy of the sheer autonomy of migration. Hence, we've witnessed a recurrent vacillation between vicious violence and begrudging complicity on the part of state actors, seeking to reinstitute Europe's borders in the face of the veritable intractability of the politics of mobility enacted by migrant and refugee movements. The profound source of the intractable crisis of migration in Europe is the veritable struggle over the borders of Europe. Migrants and refugees struggles to realize their heterogeneous migratory projects by exercising their elementary freedom of movement, thereby appropriating mobility, transgressing the border regime, and thus making spatial claims, as well as the struggle of European state powers to subdue and discipline that same autonomy of migration. The vicious severities of this extended and expansive European border zone present a fierce endurance test, a preliminary apprenticeship in what promises to be a more or less protracted career of migrant illegality, precarious labor, and deportability. Whether these mobile subjects come to be governed as refugees or migrants, however, their needs, desires, and aspirations always supersede this death-defying obstacle course, albeit at times at the cost of their lives. Haunted as Europe's borders are, by this appalling proliferation of almost exclusively non-European, non-white migrant and refugee deaths and other forms of structural violence and generalized suffering, questions of migration and asylum politics present themselves in a particularly acute way as the premier contemporary manifestations of Europe's post-colonial condition. This post-colonial dialectics reveals a struggle between the autonomous dy dynamics of human mobility on a global scale and the formations of European state power and sovereignty, which must, with, which must unrelentingly react to the migrants and refugees' exercise of an elementary freedom of movement through diverse tactics and techniques of bordering. In this respect, these two key figures, the autonomy of migration and the tactics of bordering, are central, central to and mutually constitutive of the agonistic, if not antagonistic, drama that repeatedly manifests itself as the pervasive crisis of what is finally an effectively global border regime responding everywhere to these human movements and their double-faced, double-voiced politics of mobility and presence.
and such histories are never finished. Rather than fates accompli established once and for all, these diverse and historically specific productions of migrant and refugee illegality must continue to be reproduced through ongoing practices of bordering and rebordering now on an ever more integrated, if still contradictory and uneven, European scale. Notably, these border making and border enforcing activities have been increasingly and pervasively relocated to sites within the interior of the respective migrant receiving states such that illegalized migrants and refugees, as well as their children and grandchildren, are made, in effect, to carry the border on their very bodies. As border enforcement comes to permeate the full racialized spectrum of everyday life activities and the spaces associated with what I elsewhere have called the migrant metropolis. Thus, as problems for the government of transnational human mobility and migration management, so-called these processes of illegalization remain the open-ended sites, open-ended sites for border struggles and unforeseen disputes over migrant and refugee politics, as well as the wider politics of race and citizenship. The struggles over migration, asylum, and the borders in Europe today on a European scale that encompasses and subsumes the particular histories of distinct national states are the premier sites for the unresolved post-colonial dilemma of Europe's shared centuries-old harvest of empire. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Uh, I'm sure there are many questions. I would like to kick it off with one uh, for me. I'm thinking that what you're describing and what we have seen over the past two, two and a half years and the dramatization, the spectacle, the theatrics of this have obviously been used uh, as a means to uh, promote sort of more of the same, more selection, restriction, security system, and so on. But is it for, if we think about this in terms of um, policy change and the possibility to actually engage with this in a way that we can promote some form of change. Is it possible uh, to think about, it, are there moments of rupture, even if we reject this idea that, I mean, this is just sort of the prolonged history of the way that Europe has dealt with the rest of the world, but how, can we, during this, the course of what has been named the refugee crisis, find moments that sort of, that are breaks uh, or that are ruptures that, where we can have points of entry for sort of solid engagement. Um, so this of course is the biggest and most difficult question. Um, the, I, think it, I think it does. Um, inevitably um, produce all kinds of new circumstances. And, and of course, very simply put, it, uh, it provides the occasion for lots of encounter, right? um, for lots of, opp lots of opportunities for people to find a way to engage. Right? So of course, another part of the story is you know, solidarity movements of various kinds where, to varying extents, uh, European citizens actively made choices, in many cases, to break the law, uh, to assist in a material fashion uh, the mobility of people um, who were arriving at one or another border. Um, so there were caravans organized for people, transported people in their own vehicles. And in a variety of contexts, that actually is criminalized as smuggling. So acts of solidarity increasingly have been sort of turned into occasions for the criminalization of uh, various um, kinds of activism that would seek to um, seek to assist people in transit. Um, and it's, so that that in itself, of course, is revealing of the ways in which all of this has ramifications also uh, for citizenship, but. But it also is revealing in the sense that, um, that in a whole variety of ways, people uh, responded 
uh, oftentimes with one or another kind of impulse to, um, to engage, to encounter, to assist. And um, certainly some of those forms were more predictably uh, understood, self-understood as acts of charity or um, you know, it could, it could be critiqued for various kinds of liberal condescension and so forth. Um, but you had the full spectrum of different ways in which people were pressed by the urgency of events to respond and engage. And of course, one form of that, as I say, was for various kinds of volunteerism to be subsumed within various kinds of state regimes so that the state's task was in some sense amplified and, and extended uh, through this whole variety of uh, different sort of civil society formations. Um, but there also was the full spectrum of ways in which people were trying to produce autonomous uh, and more, uh, more radical forms of intervention. And so I think that, you know, inevitably, you know, these events have occasioned various kinds of uh, ruptures, if you like, um, where there's an opportunity for engagement, there's an opportunity for intervention. Um, again, that, none, none of that is to suggest that those, that the forms in which that engagement takes are necessarily unproblematic or simple um, or straightforward. Um, but I think, you know, that is one part of the spectrum that we have to think about if we're going to talk about change in terms of policy and law and so forth. Um, because, um, you know, because any discussion of these things in a way that would sort of, you know, shrink the question of the possibility for change to, uh, to the narrow question of a question of change of enforcement policy or change of, uh, change of the law, you know, then sort of precludes a much, a much more interesting spectrum of ways in which the possibility for, uh, for more meaningful social change you know, are at stake. You know? Because I think, you know, we have to sort of have a radically open-ended imagination about the kind of questions that might take the form of, is another world possible? Is it possible to imagine that we would like to live differently, um, you know, in the broadest sense? that are part of the spectrum of how we understand what kinds of constructive or productive change could ensue from all of this. And that's where part of my effort here is to radicalize an understanding of what the stakes are. Because indeed, if we understand all of this as the inheritance, as the heritage of hundreds of years of European colonialism, among other things, um, then there are much bigger things at stake than the immediacy of how does one respond to a particular circumstance. If we only understand these things as, you know, the sort of sudden arrival of large numbers of people who have to somehow be dealt with, then we remain, uh, we, 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 we could tend, or we're at risk of reinscribing precisely this notion that somehow, oh, you know, all this stuff is external to Europe. All this stuff is sort of caused by some kind of crisis elsewhere, and this proliferation of elsewhere is imagined to be outside of Europe, that somehow arrive at Europe's door, that Europe then has to respond to, um, you know, and then we're sort of back, in the words of Franz Fanon, of imagining Europe as this sleeping beauty. Um, and, you know, indeed that's not the world we live in. So if we begin to understand the interconnections of Europe to all of the processes that produce all of these conditions, then we can begin to ask deeper questions about what kind of change is necessary. Thank you. Anyone else? We have the Global Studies team in the back. She says with pride. <laughs> I'm going to turn off. Uh, okay, I'm going to dare a question, reflection. Um, when you were talking about the, the post-colonial dilemma of Europe, uh, I was thinking about um, one of the, I think one of the most prominent aspects of this crisis, of the, or of the recent one, of 2015, uh, it was this uh, um, huge uh, humanitarian emergency response. And I've been looking uh, particularly at the case of Greece, 
uh, where basically you had a huge response both in Lesbos in 2015 when you know, the mass arrival happened. Uh, but then due to the border closures and the entrapment of people, you had basically the whole of Greece becoming a big humanitarian space. Or, I mean, there's so many camps. There were about, at about there were, I think, almost 90 camps at some point where the you know, humanitarian government of refugees was taking place. And it was not just about and it is not just about, obviously, providing food and shelter. It was also about, I mean, the relocation process was happening or being enabled through their identification and all of that. So I was thinking um, about the impact or what, what are the consequences, you think, of this rise of, of, of the humanitarian regime within the border regime? And what, what does it mean for Europe? to have a, a place like Greece, which is a little bit like a colony within Europe, if you know what I mean. Not just because of the refugee issue, but because of the economic crisis. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, most of the, that's the last point, most of the um, response, the emergency response in Greece was uh, implemented by the UN refugee agencies, not by the Greek state. Thanks. Thank you for um, the very complex uh, reflection um, that raises several interesting points. I mean, so I alluded to the fact that in the Mediterranean, that um, to varying extents, the enforcement agents, the border police in various forms, have been pressed at different moments to engage in rescue operations. Um, so this in, is one site, one kind of form in which um, the whole question of humanitarianism has been problematized within the framework of, of critical border studies. Um, because what you have is a kind of militarized humanitarianism um, and a kind of minimalist humanitarianism. Um, but um, the point that I would like to underscore is precisely that those rescues, of course, are always haunted by, uh, by the horizon that they are, in fact, arrests, detentions, potentially deportations. Um, so there's an implicatedness of that rescue which can be championed and be sort of exalted humanitarian terms um, and held up as if Europe is once again you know, the, in, the innocent who's simply responding to some kind of mess not of its own making um, by you know by um, by celebrating the notion that the, the border regime is actually about rescuing and saving people's lives right? um, and as I suggested in passing sometimes that means intercepting boats that are not even sending out distress calls, boats that have not even indicated that they had an emergency or, or otherwise in need of rescue. Um, um, you know, so so there's been a whole kind of variety of different moments in the in the last few years where different kinds of border enforcement actors um, within the sort of larger complex regime of European uh, bordering in the Mediterranean have been implicated in various ways. Including the Aegean, in that uh, at one moment you know, there were NATO ships uh, you know, conducting search and you know, search and rescue operations in the Aegean, for example. Um, and this kind of uh, militarized humanitarianism is just part of a larger spectrum that includes the things you're describing, whereby not only does Greece become charged with being the border guard of Europe. Um, and indeed with lots of extortionist kinds of clauses that require uh, Greece's uh, prospective assistance in its financial crisis uh, to become dependent upon the extent to which it can show itself to be a responsible European member by being a good border guard. But you have actually this proliferation of camps as you described whereby indeed it's not only as if the formally designated hotspots are the only hotspots. It, Indeed, you have a whole variety of makeshift hotspots, uh, some of which are self-organized migrant camps that also operate increasingly like hotspots. Um, but still more importantly, we could begin to say that, that Greece as a whole becomes a hotspot. Um, and, you know, so again, if we, if we have this critical appreciation of what, what the hotspot regime is about in the larger management of 
of uh, the so-called crisis, then Greece is one of the places that has a particularly salient role and a very important role, and it becomes inseparable from, you know, uh, from this question of um, Greece's relationship to Europe, and you know, so you have the uh, so you have this you know the, the point that you raised at the end, which is whether whether Greek whether Greece's status as European is partly at stake, whether Greece becomes in some meaningful way a virtual colony of Europe, or certainly in any case a junior partner uh, in the European project that carries with it all these added encumbrances and demands and duties. Um, and of course, this is just one example of the kinds of things that Europe has been doing actively uh, with the externalization of its borders for years with respect to other junior partner countries in North Africa, with Turkey. Um, so what you have in a sense is, is Greece coming to have to play the role um, that previously was assigned to the so-called partners in the so-called neighborhood um, of Europe. Um, but then part of what the crisis brought about was this succession of reborderings, where suddenly the borders of Europe were no longer at the ostensible margins, you know, at the presumed peri uh, peripheries, you know, no longer, say, at, you know, at Italy and Malta and Greece, or no longer at the land borders with Turkey of Greece and Bulgaria, but instead sort of found themselves imploding internally. So the next day we're in Macedonia, and then, you know, and then um, finding the way all the way to Hungary, and then onward to, uh, to Austria and Germany, and then back again to uh, Croatia and Slovenia, uh, to the point where you know, uh, people started to pronounce the whole Schengen Accord to be dead, because there were sort of reborderings, including here in Sweden, um, you know, through this whole panoply of countries across across the full extent of Europe. Um, so, in a way, that that process of the externalization dynamic reversing itself and coming internal. Uh, Greece is a pivotal point in that process, but it also in, involves this whole succession of other reborderings uh, that have riddled the question of, of Europe ever since. But part of the, part of my point is indeed that um, that that crisis of sovereignty or that dispute over sovereignty within Europe is instigated in a very significant way, precisely by the autonomy of migration, uh, and you know, and we should never lose sight of that key feature. I think, Alexandra, you were concerned the mic. Thank you very much. Uh, really enjoyed your talk. I was wondering, besides the spectacle that you have so nicely uh, showed us and many of us have witnessed ourselves, isn't there something concealed? Because, the, and, and as a follow-up to what Evie said, I, I have a feeling that more and more we're going to, to this, this era after the crisis where there is a spectacle of what we decide to look at, and there is a lot of things remaining concealed and no longer being discussed in the public sphere or by the media and sometimes not even amongst us. For instance, with the hotspot approach, we, we look at the, at, the, at the structural violence of the detention, but rarely the fact that there are people there staying more than a year or without access to toilets, been actually illustrated, been actually part of the spectacle. We have this like, huge deterioration in the conditions and violations of human rights which are now in, in, my, in, in my experience and from what I have witnessed way more severe than in 2015 that re remain concealed. So I think there is some sort of oxymoron there between the spectacle and what, what stays concealed and what stays out of sight. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. Um, well, you know, part of, part of the point of my argument about the spectacle is precisely that it always carries with it this, you know, alongside of this brightly, brightly lit scene of spectacle, it's always accompanied by the obscene, that which is less visible. Um, but part of my point in calling it the obscene, and by that I'm referring specifically to the continuous process of subordinate inclusion. Um, a part of my point in calling it the obscene is that the point of the obscene is not just to 
conceal, but to reveal. Okay? So there's a simultaneous uh, concealment and also intermittent exposure, revelation, um, because that also is productive. Right? Um, and so I think that you're identifying very important features of that kind of continuous dialectic between what is made hyper-visible and what is otherwise occluded or, or understated. Um, and, and I think that you're on to a very important you know, point, which is that what at one moment was presented as emergency, as crisis, uh, becomes normalized and prolonged so that certain kinds of states of exception, in fact, just become the, the new normal, so to speak. Um, and I think that is an important feature of the larger effect of the management of the crisis. Thank you. Uh, we started a bit late, so we have about five minutes, if someone else has a question or comment. Uh, thank you very much for this. Um, I wonder if you could just finally give us some kind of reflection on, on strategies. Uh, uh, through, I mean, we, 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 we did, you did touch through Anya's question on, on the response uh, on the fall of 2015. Uh, and now we have touched on, on how this response kind of uh, was disarmed or, 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 or subsumed under this uh, humanitarian regime. Uh, what, what I wonder is about the, the dilemma that you talked about. You touched briefly on this, this call for compassion in the beginning of your presentation. And then later you come back to the, to the dilemma of the refugee or migrant as when acting and showing her himself as the, as the, as the subject that he, he or she is becomes a suspect and a threat. Um, what, what I wonder is, what do you see, what possibilities do you see if one, if one wish to call, wish to mobilize uh, and try to break this, this logic of the spectacle you're talking about? What, what, where should we go? <laughs> so this is the return of the repressed. The first question is back at the last question. Um, no, I appreciate this question. I mean, I mean it's, as I said, it's the most difficult question. And I don't think that there's a simple or you know, kind of comprehensive kind of answer because, because of the forms in which various forms of, you know, sort of strategy for meaningful social change have to always be, they have to be located in struggle. They have to be embedded in the real forms in which people find to organize and uh, you know, won't in any simple sense be produced as a blueprint by someone sitting alone like me, you know, trying to abstractly uh, formulate it. But I, think that, but I think that the real problem is to create enduring, meaningful forms of mutual engagement and dialogue that are the basis for struggle. And, you know, in some places that might mean being organized against deportation you know, and raids. And in other places, it might be about uh, labor organizing in places where it's a context where there are um, either illegal, so-called illegal migrant workers, or even a combination of both citizen and non-citizen. Um, I think it could take many forms, but the problem is concretely, it requires that people stop acting like citizens and stop acting like Europeans and start refashioning our political imaginations um, in order to, on the one hand, take responsibility. And so it's not to suggest that in some pure act of uh, volition one could stop being materially and practically implicated in the reality of what it means to be a citizen of a particular state or a European and a uh, person racialized as white and so forth. It's not to suggest that you can somehow leap out of that uh, material and practical set of realities, right, uh, that can enter. But it means that politically we have to be able to begin to formulate together with people who are, uh, who are in, in these various kinds of migrant and refugee condition, 
uh, a struggle that refuses to take as its premise uh, the inherent nativism of a politics that says, what will we do with them? What are we going to do about them? Um, and so forth. So in that sense, I think, um, you know, I think that one sort of essential premise has to be that we stop acting like Europeans and also stop having a kind of liberal faith in citizenship. Um, and I leave that as a kind of final provocation because, because it seems to me that we have become trapped in a kind of straitjacket straight of political modernity that makes it impossible to think the question of freedom except through the lens of citizenship. Um, you know, and it's precisely when you engage meaningfully in real life with people who are non-citizens who live the repercussions of non-citizenship that, that you then understand palpably uh, that citizenship is, is a, a mechanism of uh, exclusion and uh, is, a, is a device for the production of inequalities. So is it possible to struggle together in a way that then uh, looks for a different ground on which to, to formulate politics together? Um, Maybe that's the right idea. Thank you very much. I think with that uh, provocation, we will uh, move. Uh, first, we will thank you, of course, with our applause, but because you will all leave after the applause, I just want to say uh, something on the workshops. Is Erling still around? Yeah. You're there. You want to say something. So we will hand the mic to Erling after we have thanks, Nicholas, for this fantastic. Thank you.